There were about 60 to 80 complaints a month in 2018 and 2019. But during the COVID-19 pandemic, complaints doubled to about 150 to 200 each month. I'm talking about secondhand smoke in our homes. In fact, a viewer, Cheryl Lynn, wrote in to ask us to tackle this issue. In an email, she said that many non-smokers are affected by their neighbours. So, in this episode, I want to find out, should the government ban smoking at balconies and near windows in our homes? <laughs> About 85 to 90 percent of the smoke from every cigarette ends up in the air. That's what we call secondhand smoke. It's a mixture of what a smoker breathes out and what is emitted from a lit cigarette. This smoke is a cocktail of over 250 cancer causing substances and other toxic chemicals. Secondhand smoke is said to be responsible for the deaths of some 300 non smokers in Singapore in 2019. But can a neighbour smoking at his balcony or window really affect you? I'm meeting someone who's at the end of his rope. He's asked not to be identified because the people he's upset about live right next door. They're smokers. When we moved into this flat about six years ago, we started to have very strong cigarette smoke and uh, we realised that we couldn't leave the windows open. There may be more than one member of the unit smoking. They're only smoking on the balcony, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yes, the neighbour next door. They're just a metre away with the balcony side by side. And even just smoking on the balcony, the smoke filters through the whole house. Yes, the units are not that big nowadays for HDBs. Once the smoke gets in from the living room, it quickly gets down the entire unit. We have approached the town council and the HDB, and they have sent advisory to the neighbour to advise them not to smoke near the windows and balconies. We tried speaking to the neighbour on many occasions. There's no resolution. Uh, basically, the neighbour maintains their right to smoke at the balcony. They said that there's no way they could control where the smoke would end up. So, how has this changed the way you live? I cannot leave the windows open without having to run to the living room to close the windows when we smell smoke and then uh, to air out the house with fans, especially when I have a young baby at home. Keeping the windows closed weren't enough. Mr Ng also installed rubber seals on all windows and doors. But even with those precautions, Mr Ng is worried about how much secondhand smoke his 22-month-old daughter might be taking in. So I've brought in air quality expert Dr. Xiao Wei Tie. Hello, hi. hi. Thank you for coming. <laughs> to find out how much yes. secondhand smoke the urns are still subjected to. Okay. Dr. Xiao conducts studies on homes of people affected by secondhand smoke, and she's brought along this air quality sensors. It measures PM2.5 or particulate matter which are less than 2.5 microns in diameter in the air. So if the levels of air pollution is high in the house, then the sensor will record high readings. There's a little hole here, so this is where yeah. the air goes in and comes out. The windows are all closed, that would really help reduce the air pollution, but some of the air particles are really small and might be able to enter through you know, the cracks and the uh, spaces you know, near your windows as well. So does that mean that even if I don't smell anything, it's not really safe for my kid to stay around in the living room. If you can smell it, it's definitely there. If you cannot smell it, there might be some small particles around. And that's why we're going to test it using our sensors. PM2.5 is a category of air pollutants and it's widely used as a marker for secondhand smoke exposure. Other sources of PM2.5 include car exhaust and cooking fumes. Dr. Xiao will track the air quality in the Ng's home through sensors placed in the living room where the child plays, 
the master bedroom where she sleeps and on the balcony. The sensors will also track how quickly it takes for cigarette smoke to dissipate. We will leave the sensors with the Ungs for two weeks. Meanwhile, I want to find out just how far cigarette smoke can travel. Should others beyond immediate neighbours be concerned? Here we have two piles of books to represent two typical HDB blocks. So one of the most important factors is what we call the urban canyon aspect ratio. So that ratio is basically the ratio between the height and the width between the buildings. Dr. Zhang did his simulations based on HDB blocks in Buangkok. The estate is representative of newer flats built in the 2000s. Longer sides of the blocks are north-south facing towards Singapore's prevailing wind directions. And the shorter sides are east-west facing to minimize heat from the sun. The blocks are about 18 stories high and at their widest, 30 meters apart. If this smoker is on the lower level of an HDB flat, where will the cigarette smoke travel to? The smoke particles are actually denser than air, but yet they are very small in size. So there are two conditions we can look at. The first one is on a still day. What is likely to happen is that the smoke particles will just hover around the immediate proximity without settling on the ground. And when that happens, the neighbours in the immediate proximity, maybe just below the smoker, above or even beside and then around him, will most likely be able to smell the smoke. So the second condition is by looking at wind Days. And here we assume that the wind is blowing from the north, uh, which is represented by the direction of the fan. Okay, I'll just turn that on. So from here? Yeah. So what happens when someone smokes on a lower level is that the smoke may actually be carried upwards into a vortex. And in this case, the smoke particles travel upwards. Our neighbours immediately above the smoker will most likely smell the smoke. If I were to move this smoker to another block on a slightly higher floor, like here. How will this change things? As the wind continues to blow from the north side, a vortex is actually formed in the lower to middle level parts of this HDB block. When a smoker smokes, the wind actually gets carried downwards and forms a vortex and circulates around the neighbours that is living below the smoker. And in this case, the neighbours below are all getting the smoke. On windy days, smoke particles can travel across 10 floors, but whether it flows upwards or downwards depends on the urban canyon aspect ratio, which is the ratio between the height and the width between the buildings and wind direction. How long does it take for cigarette smoke to dissipate? It takes anywhere as short as maybe one minute to a few minutes to actually escape uh, out of this area. It can go upwards, outwards, sideways even. So it's not about how close we are to the smoker. It's really about the orientation of the blocks and wind flow that determines how we get affected by secondhand smoke. So no one smokes with their windows closed, right? And many households actually have ceiling fans. So what that means is that the smoke is dispersed in small concentrations in all directions, regardless whether the smoker is smoking in the living room, by the window, or on the balcony, all the neighbours in the immediate vicinity would be able to smell the smoke. So I would say perhaps the best solution is to not smoke at all. When you meet a smoker outside, you can just move along to avoid breathing in secondhand smoke. But there's really nowhere to escape if the smoke finds its way into your home. So, how much of secondhand smoke do I need to breathe in to fall ill? I've discovered that smoking anywhere in your home, not just at your balcony or near windows, will affect your neighbours. This makes me wonder, how much secondhand smoke do we need to take in before our health is affected? I'm meeting Dr. Yvette van der Eyck. Over the years, she's written many opinion pieces 
advocating stronger tobacco control in Singapore. Most of us, when we think of secondhand smoke, we think of lung cancer. But secondhand smoke actually causes a lot of inflammation in the blood vessels, which can lead to heart disease. Also respiratory conditions like asthma attacks. In children, it can cause cough death. Ear infections, okay. um, if you're pregnant and exposed to secondhand smoke, it can cause pregnancy complications mm -hmm. like miscarriage, low term, low uh, birth weight. Wow. So actually the issues it causes are quite wide reaching and complex. It's also known to be linked to breast cancer in women. So how much of secondhand smoke do I need to breathe in to fall ill? There have been some studies looking at the effects of short term exposure to secondhand smoke, like within 10, 20 minutes. You can see here on the diagram, you've got secondhand smoke, which is going on to different parts of the body. So this is like the airways, so the first point of contact. Little yellow fireballs is basically where it starts right. inflammation. It hits the lungs. And then when it goes into the bloodstream, it can cause inflammation in the blood vessels, which can then be a precursor for heart diseases respiratory inflammation. Oh my goodness, actually the minute it's inhaled, it's already affecting us. Yes. From the airways. Of course, then there are going to be people who are more sensitive to those inflammatory effects than others. Young children and babies are much smaller. When they breathe in secondhand smoke, they're getting a much higher volume of toxicants than, say, an adult. And someone who, say, has asthma, it's going to be much more of a trigger than, say, someone who doesn't. And then at the same time, you also have genetic differences in how we react to certain things. So that's why there's no safe level of secondhand smoke. So then, should we ban smoking on balconies or near windows at home? Right now, it seems to be treated like a, a neighborly nuisance. When people are affected by secondhand smoke in their homes, they're told to sort it out with a neighbor. I think there are multiple approaches that we could take here. Not all of them have been tried. If you think of it as a ladder of interventions, at the very bottom, you have education, so people know about it. And then, okay, let's try and incentivize smokers to smoke somewhere else. So like designated smoking points. And then the next level would be we disincentivize mm. it. So it's like a stick approach. They can still smoke in their homes, but we make it difficult or unpleasant. And then yeah. the, the final frontier would be really regulation. Where are we on that ladder right now? Well, we're right at the bottom because we haven't done anything about it. So even if there's something like a public education campaign saying, oh, actually, when you smoke on your balcony, you're exposing quite a lot of people, mm -hmm. they're the ones who will voluntarily go down and smoke right. outside. I've never realized that even a brief exposure to secondhand cigarette smoke might trigger a host of health issues, and more so for the vulnerable around us, like children and pregnant women. Dr. Van der Eyck believes that authorities can look at other measures before regulating smoking in homes. This is in direct contrast to one member of parliament who firmly believes that regulation is the way to go. It is already illegal for you to be naked in your own home if your neighbours can see you. It's illegal to keep cats in HDB flats. It's illegal for you to make too much noise in your own homes after 10.30. All these things are illegal because it affects your neighbours, but it doesn't kill them. Secondhand smoke kills. MP Lewis Ng has pitched banning smoking on home balconies and near windows twice in Parliament, but he was shot down both times. Enforcement will be challenging as capturing evidence of the smoking offence is not straightforward. Smelling the tobacco smoke is not sufficient as cameras must capture the smoker smoking or holding a lighted cigarette as evidence for enforcement. Cameras could have to be of sufficient resolution and trained directly into units. Their field of view would also cover neighbouring units and potentially include innocent neighbours engaged in other activities. Are we prepared for such intrusive measures? So authorities have said that it's not possible to use existing laws to ban smoking in homes and also that it might be challenging to enforce it. So why do you think it's still possible? What I raise in Parliament is that actually enforcement is the last two. A deterrence is the biggest two. I mean, you're here now. If it's illegal to smoke at your windows or balcony and you can see someone there, obviously most people are not going to do it because we are a country of law-abiding citizens. Without regulations, the behaviours usually won't change. This has been an age-old problem. People have tried all sorts of ways to talk to the neighbours, to get the authorities, the NEA, the HDB involved, 
even go to court. So you're saying that public education is not working? I think that has to go hand in hand with legislation. It is not one or the other. I mean, people are dying not by their choice. If you want to smoke, you will bear the consequences of it. But here we have hundreds dying because of someone else's decision to smoke. And I don't think that's fair. So after having been unsuccessful twice in Parliament... Not unsuccessful, not successful yet. Right, yes, that's a good one. So not being successful yet, how else are you going to tackle this issue? A couple of weeks back, I decided we would do a, a feedback form, uh, launch it publicly. Over 2,000 people responded. A lot of them are speaking up, urging for help, not for themselves, but really for their children and for family members who have respiratory uh, illness. And again, it's not a nuisance or a smell issue, it is a health issue. I think the other surprising data is that a majority didn't speak to their neighbours. They don't want to strain the relationship and so they suffer in silence. Why do you feel so strongly about this issue? We do our home visits almost every week and that has been a constant feedback. People are begging for help. And I think that's again where the government has to step in to make sure that the voices of these people are heard and our policies address the concerns and the very valid concerns that they're raising. Remember the Ungs? Two weeks ago, we installed three sensors around the house. I wanted to know, even with the windows closed and rubber seals installed, are they still affected by their neighbours' cigarette smoke? Almost two weeks ago, air quality expert Dr. Xiao Weiche and myself left air quality sensors in Mr. Ng's home. He's worried that the secondhand smoke from his neighbor's house will affect his child's health. Now, we're on our way to find out what the air quality readings of his home look like. Now, remember, Mr. Ng does not want to be identified because his next door neighbor is the cause of his problems. <laughs> In general, the outdoor air is actually dirtier than the indoor air. Right, and that makes sense because the neighbours smoke right beside the balcony. So obviously right. it's going to have a higher reading of um, pollutants. It's uh, much higher than the World Health Organization's recommended guideline. I don't think Mr Ng should do gardening for an hour each day. Probably should cut down on that. PM 2.5 readings from the balcony show spikes of up to 60 micrograms per cubic metre. That's four times the World Health Organization's safe guideline of 15 micrograms per cubic metre per day. While not all the spikes in air quality can be attributed to secondhand smoke, some do match Mr Ng's record of when he smelt cigarette smoke. The living room and the bedroom levels are very comparable. We see the same trend. When one goes up, the other room also goes up. Maybe just delayed by a few seconds because of the diffusion of the air particulates in, into the house. In general, the air quality in Mr Ng's um, indoor environment is acceptable, except for some peaks here and there. The levels are mostly well within the WHO standard. That does mean that Mr Ng has to stay indoors all the time, shut inside. But on certain days, you know, whereby the wind direction is blowing it away from your home, then I think it's a good idea to also ventilate your house once in a while as well. But I wouldn't know when the neighbor is going to smoke and when the wind is going to change direction. So pretty much I will still have to keep my doors and windows closed all the time, especially if there are vulnerable people in my house. Can an air purifier help solve this issue? Air purifier um, doesn't really do much. According to Singapore's health ministry, it is unaware of any air purifiers in the market that can completely remove the toxic substances from cigarette smoke. Would you consider moving out? Uh, we would, but there are other prevailing factors like property prices and availability of properties that we can move to as well. Moving out is clearly not an option for everyone, so some estates have designated smoking points like this. Now, I'm at Nisun South, where there's about one smoking point every three blocks. 
The aim is to get smokers out of their house and to light up here. It seems convenient because it's relatively close to home for them, but I notice a problem. These smoking points are not contained, and so cigarette smoke does waft out. Over at Clementi, there's this, a smoking cabin. It's been on trial since mid-2021. As you can see, it's fully enclosed, it's air-conditioned. That might be a draw to get smokers to use it. Best part is, unlike open-air smoking points, if a smoker smokes a cigarette in here, it doesn't affect the person outside. Some smokers in the area say they do come down to use it. But this is the only smoking cabin of its kind in a residential estate in Singapore. Will more of it solve the problem of second-hand cigarette smoke at home? One cabin isn't cheap though. This costs 19,000 Singapore dollars and that's not including the monthly operating costs of a few hundred dollars. Your home is your private property, but if what you do at home impacts others, well, that's a different story. The adverse health impact breathing in secondhand cigarette smoke has, from respiratory issues to even cancer, should not be dismissed, especially for the people around us who are most vulnerable, like our children. So perhaps more can be done. We could start by incentivizing smokers to smoke away from their homes. And if all else fails, perhaps authorities could relook the feasibility of banning smoking near windows and at balconies in homes. <laughs>